Hello everyone, welcome to this new message. Uh, before I go into the new message, which I've called Trusting God to Supply Manna. Trusting God to Supply Manna. Before we get into that, I want to make a, a short statement for those of you who are regular listeners. Uh, this particular message will be the, the last one for a few weeks. I had a, a feeling from the Lord that I need to set some time apart to, for prayer and fasting over the Christmas period, into the, well, up till the new year, I guess, um, for his, his will, for, for my life and for the, the ministry. So I hope you'll bear with me and uh, there will be messages next year, but they won't begin until the new year. Okay, that's over and done with. Let's commit this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for your word, which is truth, absolute truth. I ask, Father God, that you would grant your Holy Spirit lead us into this truth as we search your word today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now as I've said, I've called this message, this final one for this year, Trusting God to Supply Manna. Trusting God to Supply Manna. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus, chapter 16. <clears throat> now we're going to be reading quite a bit of scripture today, so please bear with me. And uh, if you can't follow everything that I'm saying, jot down some notes and read it again in your own time, because believe me, it's important. Exodus chapter 16, I'm going to be reading from verse 1 through to verse 15. Exodus 16, verse 1. <clears throat> Let's read together. And they took their journey from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, saying, uh, in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For you have brought us forth unto this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And I'd like you to remember this following verse. Underline it if you like, or put a mark by it. Verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven, for you and the people shall go out to, and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, At even, then you shall know that the Lord hath brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that you murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be, when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which you murmur against him. And what are we? Murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And Moses spoke unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake, unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. 
And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that, the, that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Praise God for his word. This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Hallelujah. Now at the time of our text today, that's Exodus chapter 16, at the time of our text, the children of Israel had been traveling some 30 days since they left Egypt. And it would be reasonable to assume that the then quickly gathered food supplies for their journey were now running out, if in fact they hadn't run out already. <clears throat> Understandably then, the people were becoming restless, even anxious about how they were going to survive any further without food and drink in this desert. This fear of the unknown of what lay ahead and how they would find food and shelter etc then caused them to come to Moses and bring the following complaint. I'm going to read again verse 3 of our text. And the children of Israel said unto them, that's Moses and Aaron, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now it's, it's easy for us to look at this and say, how ungrateful of these people after all the wonderful and miraculous works of God that had led them to being set free from their bondage in Egypt and then to be witness to the parting of the Red Sea, plus the following destruction of Pharaoh and his army when it closed together again. However, before we think of judging them for their lack of faith and trust in God, we should first remember that they didn't have the benefit of the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, as we have today, who are born in Christ. These people were slaves, literally slaves. They were used to being told when to get up and go to work, when to eat, when to drink, when to sleep, and so on and so on. Now here they are in the desert, the wilderness, with no provisions and a long journey ahead of them. Now they were also used to obeying their taskmasters and of course Pharaoh whom they could all see with their own eyes. They knew their enemy. Now they were being told to trust in an unseen God to meet all their needs. And you know that's a problem that everybody today can relate to, I'm sure who has been through or is going through difficult times in their life. You know, brethren, life can be just like that today. Before you became a disciple of the Lord Jesus, a believer, a born-again believer, your life would most probably have been in some kind of regular routine. Most, if not all of that routine, was based around your job, your career, your wages or salary governed just what you could do outside of that job. By this I mean what size and type of home you could afford, what kind of car you could drive, if in fact you can drive, if not using public transport, etc. What your diet was like, even what you did with your spare time, if you 
I don't know if that is. Meaning socialising and holidays and so on. There would have been many people in the same boat, so to speak, as you, where you worked. So you had a number of them who you probably socialised with, outside work, friends and acquaintances. What I'm saying, brethren, is that the average person who does not know the Lord or believer before they knew the Lord had a life which was pretty much a regular routine. It was pretty much the same day to day. It was known that each day would be pretty much the same as the next. So much so that you could plan ahead for such things like holidays and so on. Plus there were a number of people around you, friends, acquaintances as I've said, who thought and acted and lived as you did. When and if however a person is born again, life becomes somewhat different, as I'm sure many of you will understand and know. You may not have been from the town or country where you have lived, but you no longer belong to the same group of friends and acquaintances that you once did. The reason for this is simple. It's because you no longer think and act as they do, as you once did yourself, because you're now born anew by the Spirit of God. You've now been imbued with the nature and the mind of Christ Jesus. You've died with Christ and have been made a new creation a new species. Turn them, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's a scripture that I've used many, many times and I make no apologies for it. Speaking about being new creations and new species. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Let's read together. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are now become new. Now, I'm sure that many, if not all of you, will have either read or heard this scripture many times before. Many of you who are regular listeners would have heard me use this scripture many times myself. However, my brothers and sisters in the faith, it is vital that we really understand the depth and importance of what the Apostle Paul has said here. First of all, Paul says that if any man be in Christ, he is therefore a new creature. What exactly does this mean though? Well, the word he is a new, he is a new, are in fact one Greek word. And that Greek word is kainos, kainos, and it means new, as respects form, recently made, fresh, unused, of a new kind or unprecedented type, novel, uncommon, unheard of. It's brand new. Then we have the word creature. This is the Greek word ktisis, ktisis. And that means the act of founding, establishing or building, the act of creating or creation, anything that is created. This is why I could say that all who are born again are a new species, because that's exactly what the, these words mean. A new creation, something newly created, a new species on the earth. We are born from above, born anew. Next, we have old things are passed away. Now the words old things are one Greek word and that Greek word is archaos, archaos. And that means that has been from the beginning. Original, primal, old or ancient. Next, there is are passed away. And this again is one Greek word, that being parachomai, parachomai, 
which means to go past, to pass by. In other words, to leave behind oneself. The old things have been left behind and we carry on without them. Finally, we have behold all things are become new. Now this is made up of three Greek words. Four Greek words, sorry. The first one is behold. And that is the Greek word idu, idu, meaning behold or see. In other words, something that's visible, seen by everyone, including you. Next is all things. Now that's one Greek word, which is pass, pass. That means each or every, the whole, everyone, all things, everything. Then we have are become. This again is one Greek word, ginomai, ginomai. And it means to become, to come into existence, to come into being. Then we have the word new. This is the Greek word kainos again that we heard earlier, which means new of a new kind, unprecedented, novel, uncommon. To tie all this together, you should now see and understand that a believer in Christ, a disciple if you like, is something brand new, something not seen before, a new creation of God. It's a new species on the earth. The body of Christ is a new creation, a new species on the earth, something that's never been before. I wanted you to both see and understand this point, brethren, because that is just what the people of Israel were when God, through Moses, brought them out of Egypt. They had been saved by the blood which was sprinkled on the doorposts and the lintels of their home, whereby the destroyer had then passed over. This is where we get the word Passover, the feast of Passover, because the destroyer passed over their homes. They had been taken out of the world, or Egypt, which is a type of the world. Then they were baptised when they passed through the Dead Sea on dry land. They now belonged to God. They had been purchased by God. Just as we now belong to Christ. Do you see it, brethren? Their salvation from bondage to Pharaoh in Egypt is a prophetic picture and type of our salvation from sin and the world through Christ Jesus. There is so much more for us to learn from their experiences in the wilderness. So much more than even we're going to look at in this message. This is the reason why I felt it necessary today to lay this foundational base before studying our text for today which concerns the blessed gift of the manna so let's begin to look at the manna we're going to look at the manna a gift of God now as I sincerely hope you've seen the people of Israel in our text today were as we were when we first became saved. They had been slaves to Pharaoh. Now they were expected to follow an unseen God. In effect, brethren, they were babes in their new life as the people of God, just as we were when we were born again. They were no longer slaves, but they carried with them that mindset of slaves. Just as we, when we were born again, still carried with us that mindset of our routine in the world. I'm sure that you can see the picture here as it reflects our situation in Christ when we were first saved. I truly hope that you do, brethren, because it is our responsibility to learn from the mistakes of the Old Testament Israel. That's why these things were written for our benefit, that we may learn from their mistakes. 
The Israelites were, as I have said previously, used to living as slaves. They depended upon Pharaoh for their food, housing and order of life and so on. Now they were out of Egypt. They were in a desert, a wilderness. They were continually on the move, no fixed home, and only what they'd been able to carry out of Egypt to sustain them on the journey. Now at the point where we meet up with them in our text, their rations, as I said, were running out, if they in fact hadn't already. So they begin to complain to Moses and Aaron, the leaders they could see. As we see in our, the first verse of our text today, in this first verse, sorry, not the first verse, verse 3. Let's read it again together. Exodus 16, verse 3. And the children of Israel said unto them, that's Moses and Aaron, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for you have brought us forth unto this wilderness, to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now they had already had a prophetic promise from God, that he would bring them unto the promised land the day they came out of Egypt. Here, let's turn back to Exodus chapter 13, please, if you will. Exodus chapter 13. And we're going to read three verses. From verse 3 to verse 5. Exodus chapter 13, starting from verse 3. <clears throat> let's read together. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day, this day, sorry, came you out in the month of Abib. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. There's the promise. This should remind you of the promise of an ultimate destination, both for the people of Israel and for us as believers in Christ Jesus, because God changes not. His promises are yea and amen. To back that up, turn with me to the Gospel of John if you will. The Gospel of John chapter 14. As I said, we're going to read a lot of scripture today, so please be prepared and let your fingers be nimble. John chapter 14 verses 1 to 3. John chapter 14 verse 1. Let's read together. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now this is a promise that Jesus repeated once again here later on in the Gospel of John, John chapter 17, turn with me again if you will, to John chapter 17, verses 23 and 24. Let's read together, John 17, verse 23. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah, for the promises of God. Amen. Amen. Now they had been promised 
This is the people of Israel, the Israelites. They had been promised a sure destination, the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, just as we have been promised a sure destination, a house in the mansion of God, a place with Christ where he is. However, they, just as we, have to learn to trust and to depend upon the God to supply all that is needed for the journey ahead. Just as scripture tells us we do. F turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, please. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Let's read together. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Let's read together. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let's read that again, brethren. But my God, say that in a personal way, your God. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. That's God's promise to you, brethren. If you're in Christ Jesus, he'll supply all your need, not your wants, but your needs, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Don't we serve a great God, a wonderful God, a majestic God? Now the people of Israel did not have the benefit of the last scripture. when they came through the plagues in Egypt and all that happened crossing the Red Sea. Now, my brethren, let's consider the matter of the manna. Manna, I'm saying today, is a picture of the grace of God. Manna is a picture of the grace of God. At this point, my brethren, I'd like you to look again at the following verse in our text. Remember, I asked you to remember verse 4, Exodus 16, verse 4. Underline it if you need it to or put a mark by it. I'd like us to read that scripture once again together. Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Let's read together. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will more walk in my law or not. Now brethren, I'd like you to notice here that God did indeed promise them to provide bread but that he emphasises that it's from heaven. I would like you also to notice that this promise came with a challenge. This challenge was whether or not the people would walk in God's law or not. This latter point might seem confusing to you, as you might be thinking that the law came later on Mount Sinai. Well, the law or the commandments concerning the gift of manna came later on in our text today as we read at the beginning of this message. This law concerning the manna came in our text. Verse 16, Exodus 16, verse 16. Let's read together. Exodus 16, verse 16. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather it of every man according to his eating, an omer for every man, according to the number of your persons. Take you every man for them which are in his tents. Now the people basically were to gather each morning enough to last them that day. For each family, each member had enough to last them each day for that particular day until the morning of the following day. However, some tried to gather more than they really needed. 
and they found that the following morning what they had gathered had gone rotten and had got maggots in it, as we are going to read now in verse 19 and following. Exodus chapter 16, 19 and 20. Verse 19, And Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not to Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was wroth with them, or he was angry with them, in other words. Now I'd like you to see here, brethren, that this law has never been rescinded. This law about the manna has never been rescinded. How do we know that? Well, I'm going to tell you now. Jesus himself incorporated this law in the daily prayer he taught his own disciples. And by extension, you and I also. In the following scripture, which you all must know well, I think, each and every one of you must know this prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. And I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have prayed it many times, if not daily. Let's read it together. Turn with me to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. We're going to read from verse 9 through to verse 13. <clears throat> and I wonder if any of you have ever linked these two things together. Well, let's, let's read it through now. And I hope that you'll begin to understand what this message is about. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Jesus speaking here. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Underline that verse. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. However, what exactly is this bread in this prayer that Jesus taught? It is in fact the very crux of this message today, brother, and it's exactly what we are now going to look into. Bread from heaven. Bread from heaven. I'd like here to show you two scriptures. One from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. The first from the Old Testament is from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. I'd like you to Turn there with me and read with me together. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knowest not neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of of the Lord doth man live. Hallelujah. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus in the wilderness speaking here. Matthew 4, verse 4. Let's read together. But he answered, and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Praise the Lord. 
Now in this, the first scripture that we read, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, God is telling his people in the wilderness that he allowed them to go hungry in order that they would seek him for their needs. Also to trust that he would honour his word to provide what they would need each and every day of their journey. This was the law of the manna. In the second scripture, Jesus himself rebuffs the taunts of Satan to turn a stone into bread to satisfy his hunger using the same Old Testament verse. Now the word bread in the first scripture is the Hebrew word lechem, lechem, which means food or uh, bread or grain, food to eat, a loaf of meat. It's virtually the same as the second word, which is the Greek word artos, which itself means bread or loaf, bread, or even showbread. These two Greek and Hebrew words are virtually the same. However, in the context of our two scriptures, it means much, much more, as we will see as we carry on. In these two scripture verses, and also in our text today, more of a picture or type of something much deeper and more profound to a believer in Christ emerges. More of a picture or a type of something much deeper, more profound to a believer in Christ reveals itself. Brethren, the bread that we are talking about in both of the scriptures that we've read and indeed our text for today, Exodus 16, which is for the sake of this message the more important of them, is rather a picture or type of the grace of Almighty God. The, word, the Old Testament word grace is khan, khan, graciousness, that is subjectively kindness or favour, favour or grace, favoured. The New Testament word for grace is charis, charis, meaning graciousness. It's of spiritually, especially the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. It's benefit, an unmerited favour. As you can see, they are both virtually the same. And so we are speaking of the same thing here. In our text in the fourth verse that we have repeated, we see that God said that he would rain down bread from heaven for his people. He did so to fulfill their daily need for food. However, as we can also see in this same verse, he did it to see if the people would trust him to provide for that need each and every separate day. In other words, to obey him, to trust him, to have faith in him. Now what each and every one of you who believe This test goes for you and I today, just as it did for the Israelites in the wilderness. Jesus himself spoke a lot about bread in the Gospel accounts. If you read the Gospels, you will hear a lot about bread in those Gospels. In fact, in the Gospel of John, there's a whole portion given over to the subject and I believe that it's important for us to at least take a look at a few verses in the following chapter. Turn with me to John chapter 6. And to begin with, we're going to look at verse 32 and 33. John chapter 6, 
verse 32 and 33. There's much in this chapter about bread, but let's take each piece as it comes. John chapter 6, verse 32. Let's read together. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Now this particular scripture happened just after Jesus had fed the 5,000 and then he had walked upon the waters of the Sea of Galilee, crossing across the sea. After the people around him had criticised him for saying that he was the bread which came down from heaven, Jesus then says the following. Turn down now to John chapter 6, verse 43. Verse 43, and we're going to read right through to verse 51. John chapter 6, verse 43 to 51. Verse 43, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father come unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now again, after much discussion amongst the people and amongst the disciples, I'm sure, Jesus finishes this narrative using the following words. And we're going to jump down to John chapter 6, verse 53, down to verse 58. John chapter 6, verse 53 to 58. Verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Can you see, brethren? Can you see the, the picture there from the Old Testament to the New? Now in conclusion, to tie all this together, I know there's been a lot of scripture and maybe you can listen to the message again to get it clear in your mind or to jot down the verses. For I said that the bread in the wilderness, in our text today, Exodus chapter 16, the manna in our text was a picture of the grace of God. And so it is. We have looked at much scripture today. 
and I make no apology for that. However, we've not finished yet. There's one more scripture to show you, which I hope will help you understand about the bread and the grace of God, and that we need to trust in God to supply our need each and every day. Just as the Old Testament Israelites did in the wilderness. For this, we must now turn to the Gospel of Luke. Please turn with me, if you will, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verse 19. Luke 22, verse 19. Let us read together. Verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. I love that scripture. I love the communion. I love to be able to remember Christ who died to pay the price that we could never pay, brethren. The bread is a picture of his body and the, the wine is a picture of his blood and we're to remember that when we partake of it. Now this, of course, is the eating of the bread, Luke twenty two nineteen. It's a, the eating of the bread at the Last Supper in the communion instituted by Jesus himself. Now this is very important for every one of us who believe because it should remind us that we need the strength, we need the wisdom and we need discernment and protection of God in and over our lives every single day not just once a week, but we need these things each and every day, just as the Israelites in the wilderness needed to trust God every day to provide their needs. So we need to trust in God through his precious son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to supply our need. And remember, he has promised to supply our needs, not our wants. And he has promised to supply our needs daily. But we are not to take it for granted, as some did in the wilderness. This is, I believe, why Jesus used the term daily bread in the prayer that he taught his own disciples, the format that he taught them to come before the Father each and every day. He taught his own disciples this prayer. And by extension, that means you and I. Each and every one of you who are listening today and those who are not listening but are born again of the Spirit of God. Do you pray this bread day, this prayer sorry daily this is the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples it's the way that he taught them to approach the living God so next time you awake don't just jump out of bed get dressed have breakfast and go to work commit your day to the Lord next time you awake don't forget, don't forget, sorry, to turn to Almighty God. And as Jesus taught, ask him for what you will most definitely need for that day. The living bread. In closing, brethren, I would like us all to recite that prayer that Jesus taught together. Yes, I want us to recite that prayer together. And as we do, remember that we receive by the grace of God. It is unmerited favour. In other words, we, 
we don't really deserve it. There's nothing we can do to earn it. It's unmerited favour. It's what God has promised to bless us with if we will seek it and trust for it. We don't deserve it, but he will grant it if we come humbly and with faith and ask for it. So let's recite that prayer together. Remembering it's what Jesus taught his own chosen disciples. And didn't he choose you? And I? So he's teaching us this important prayer. Please remember it, brethren, as we read it together. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. And I'm sure you know it well. Verse 9, Matthew chapter 6. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, brethren. Remember this. And until the next time, my brethren, in the new year, may the Lord richly bless and keep each and every one of you in his grace. Amen.